Hi, and welcome to Table Talk Back. My name is Rodney Smith, and in this video, we're going to take a look at your responses to the previous Table Talk video about game balance. And you'll remember that last time I tried to do it outside and it just didn't work. Well, sometimes you just got to try again. So I'm going to try again. It's a little colder than the last time we recorded because it's much later. I apologize for the delay between these episodes. It's been a busy end of the year period. Now, if you didn't catch the initial video, please check the description below and get caught up so this video makes more sense. For the rest of you, thank you so much for your thoughts on this topic. I received over 500 comments and I read them all. And while I can't possibly address all of them here, I picked a selection of them for us to look at. David Phillips wrote, I think it is possible to perfectly balance a game to every skill level. Just remove all strategy and make it 100% luck. Candyland is technically a perfectly balanced game, but anyone who wins will know they had very little to do with their own success. That said, in games where your choices do matter, if there's always one obviously superior course of action, everyone will take it and you'll essentially be in the same boat as Candyland. Now, in the last video, I mentioned one of the challenges of balancing games is that game groups themselves aren't balanced. Every player has different skills that they come to the table with. So even a perfectly balanced game won't necessarily feel balanced in practice because some players will make better decisions than others. And I thought David had a fun observation because it shows one of the other challenges of game balance. If you're trying to remove some of the inherent inequality that players bring to the table, one way to do that is to take some control from them through random events, dice rolls, card draws, and so on. But too much of that, and players can start to feel like their choices don't matter. And if you have a game where there's perfect information, then technically, if you study the game long enough, you should always be able to puzzle out the best thing to do, which is its own kind of problem. Because if there's only one best choice, is there really a choice? <laughs> Thankfully, of course, most of us aren't clever enough to be able to see the one best choice in every situation. I know I can't. For example, I thought the best choice was to come out here in the freezing cold and try to record this video with geese squawking in the background. Clearly, I wasn't correct. Vern Ron Wee Kalanon wrote, a balanced game is one where all presented strategies are viable ways to win the game. I never like to directly disagree with those of you who comment because I have so much control over the conversation already and you're not here to perhaps more fully explain what you mean, but I actually think that this is a trap some players fall into when playing games and it may unfairly give the impression that a game isn't balanced. For example, when I spoke about tapestry in the last video, I mentioned that at the end of one of the games, the players there were convinced that technology was an impossible strategy. And then the next group declared that technology was a crazy, powerful strategy. I don't think that either were necessarily wrong. It's just that not all strategies are equally powerful in every situation. And I think this is something that I fall prey to all the time. I see that a game offers a way to score points, I'm attracted to something in that. Perhaps I just think, well, okay, this is a way to score points, but it also looks like a fun way to play. I'm going to do that. And then I get my butt kicked. <laughs> now, it doesn't mean that the strategy wasn't viable. It just wasn't necessarily viable in that particular play of the game. Nicholas Dunlap wrote, or Dunlop wrote, an interesting point I have experienced is how if someone, such as a reviewer or fellow player, says a method or tactic is overpowered, then others can become biased towards that thought and maybe make it true themselves after one play of the game. Now, maybe it is true, but can they say that without exploring the game more? I think I've experienced this too, especially as a new player to a game. If someone more experienced says to me, look, play how you like, but just keep in mind, the six camel strategy in this game is very powerful. Don't let a player get it. Now, I'm probably going to be thinking of that when I'm playing, and it's going to influence my gameplay. And if the table all starts to play with that thought in mind, it's going to shape the way that we're playing, which also shapes which strategies will work or won't, or which ones will even be tried. And that can potentially reinforce biases about the balance rather than creating opportunities for them to be challenged. 
this is where I talked about my friend Pep in the last video. People would insist, Strategy X can't win in this game. And very possibly within their game group, that was true. But they hadn't necessarily encountered a Pep employing Strategy X. So they were undervaluing its effectiveness in more capable hands. Now, speaking of Pep, Rick Havoc writes, in my group, everyone thinks I'm Pep and that I win an unfair number of games. And this has changed their play style. And any time they have an opportunity to hurt someone else's game, I'm the one targeted because Terry always wins. It's the mantra of the table. They feel I'm the best player, and therefore I'm the one they always have to stop. And you know what's funny? I don't mind being targeted, even when I'm clearly not the leader. What bugs me is the public display that they are targeting me. It's almost unsportsmanlike. <laughs> well, Rick Havoc, I want you to know you've been heard, and although Pep isn't here to speak for himself, I think he would relate to your story, because that exact thing has happened to him on more than one occasion. In the absence of a good reason to put someone else at a disadvantage, people would pick the player perceived to have the best chance of winning, which was typically Pep. And it was often publicly declared that way at the table. It was almost a table joke, which I have to imagine did frustrate him at times especially when he felt he could see that he clearly wasn't the one winning and that by picking him as the default target, it was both unfairly giving him a disadvantage and then giving someone else really an unfair advantage. And again, I think that feeds into the idea I shared that even if a game is balanced mathematically, game groups just aren't. You put a bunch of humans together <laughs> and you get decisions being made for all kinds of inaccurate reasons, which even a perfectly balanced game can't really account for. Now, I don't know if you've noticed, but the geese in the background, they're kind of loud. Uh, I don't know if they're as loud for you as they are for me, but I think what I'll do is just relocate us a little further away from them so we're not competing as much with their conversation. Okay, I think this will be better, but we'll, we'll see. Luprick86 wrote, I think it can be too much of a cop-out to blame the player group if a certain tactic, card, or combo is clearly mathematically imbalanced. And Mianzilla's wrote, Rodney, I think you're mixing two different things. Sure, not all players will play equally well, but an overpowered problem is one where a big group of people agree a particular thing is too strong. And these two comments represented, I think, a few people's concerns that my video was perhaps oversimplifying the topic of game imbalance. And something I would want to clarify in this case and really in any of these table talks is that when I express a point of view, it's to make a particular observation and then open up to a bigger discussion. In this case, the observation I was making is that gamers will sometimes, after just one or two plays of a game, declare with confidence, this game is broken or you know, this game is imbalanced. As uh, Jeffrey Heffernan wrote, most game balance threads begin with a statement just got finished my first game. You know, and after that first game, they have some formed opinion. So I wanted to look at what I perceive to be that kind of common reaction and ask us to consider how quickly we go to that claim when there could be other possibilities. But I'm certainly not dismissing the reality that games can be imbalanced. That just wasn't for me the more interesting perspective on the conversation. For example, we talked about tapestry in that last video. And using it as an example wasn't to suggest that Tapestry was balanced and beyond criticism. Actually, since then, Stonemaier Games released adjustments for eight of the civilizations, now that data from over 2,000 plays have been collected. Now, the majority of the civilizations had what I think most people would agree were reasonable win ratios, but a few did seem to be outliers and have been adjusted. Nathan Breaker wrote, one aspect of this that I don't believe was discussed is how players are responsible for balancing each game to some extent. In our first plays of games, we don't know the optimal strategies and thus are likely not blocking and thwarting other strategies as the game designer intended. I think that's a fair point. You know, Blood Rage has what is known as the Loki strategy, which basically if someone gets all of the Loki cards, it can create a very powerful combination. However, the game includes card drafting. So for someone to get all of the Loki cards, it usually means the rest of the table was giving them to that player, which you don't know not to do the first time that you play. And I think when the game first came out, that strategy was seen as super broken. But since drafting is an inherent part of the game, I assume it is the designer's intention that players draft 
smarter, which they probably will do after more plays. James Vinning wrote, I think a lot of people expect scores to be close at the end of a game, irrespective of player skill when they're thinking about balance. And Di Lopez wrote, I have no idea if the factions in Gaia Project are all balanced, but some of them are more straightforward. It's not necessarily that they're inherently better, but some just take a little less thought in order to play them well. And while I believe balance is important, I think perceived imbalance is more important. It doesn't matter if your game is mathematically perfect if everyone stops playing because they think that it isn't. That is, I think, kind of the rub, isn't it? Because a game may actually be balanced in some measurable way, but it's our perception that will win out at the end of the day, isn't it? I mean, if a game ends with one person having a wildly lower score than everyone else, unless it's inherently obvious that they played poorly, then that probably won't feel right to the players. And because many games have hidden information, it's hard to backtrack and see where maybe a player made you know, an obvious strategy mistake. So then it starts to feel like it's the game that must be making the mistakes and not the players. And that feeling is arguably more important than reality. Because, you know, it's our feelings that often drive a lot of our decisions and thoughts. So what can game designers do about this problem? Well, I think one thing is you can play test, right? And as we talked about in the first video discussion, you need to play test with a variety of different groups of players, not just the same group over and over that may default to you know, a particular style of play. Also, I think if you have multiple factions like in Gaia Project, then it can be helpful to communicate to the players, maybe in the rule book, that some will be easier to play than others. Empires of the North, for example, has six different factions and the rule book rates them on relative difficulty based on their strategies. So while they are supposedly balanced against each other, it might take a few plays with one particular faction to really understand how it works best, while another one you might be able to master right out of the gate. And I think that's a good way of setting more accurate player expectations. Now I think the other thing game designers can do is listen, which Seth Van Orden, the designer of Stockpile and the Reckoners, says here. It can be natural for a game designer or publisher to blame lack of game experience when players start accusing our games of bad balance, when we ourselves might have made a balancing mistake. Consider games as complicated as Magic the Gathering. It manages to miss game-breaking strategies despite having a team of experts looking for them. It's okay to make mistakes both as players and designers and to admit and fix them. I think this is a good insight and one that I hope people take to heart in this discussion. Yes, I do think games are prone to personal biases that may make them too quickly blame game design when things don't go their way after a first play. But we also have to know that games are imperfect things and designers do make mistakes. Speaking of game design though, some of you got quite invested in the fake game that I was playing in the last video. Maximilian Berbachevlov wrote, well, to be honest, six camels per turn is pretty overpowered. Christian Johansson wrote, that's like 12 humps per turn, that's crazy overpowered. Paul Paulson wrote, it is, but it only pays off if there are enough turns left. When I see someone building towards that card, I start trying to collect a set of three witches of different colors. If that succeeds, I can end the game early. With only six or 12 extra camels, that's usually not enough for the player to win. Even if they unlock the magic chariot and get lucky on a d12 to beat the dragon on the first try and loot the bonus pudding, they would then need an extra turn or two to convert that into victory points, to which slow-mo train wreck wrote, spice wagons, not victory points. You almost stripped the game of its theme there. All of that to say, my fake dragon fighting camel wagons game is the closest I'll likely ever get to designing a game. So thank you for taking it so seriously. I feel validated. To end though, let's hear from Doug Fevolo who wrote, if I win, it is clear evidence that a game is beautifully crafted, well designed, and a highly balanced masterpiece. If I lose, it's quite obvious no thought or playtesting was ever put into it. On that lighthearted note, I just want to thank you again for joining me for another Table Talk Back. Thank you for sharing your insights and for being a part of this discussion and this hobby. If you have further ideas about what was discussed here, feel free to leave them in the comments below. And also remember to give this video a thumbs up, subscribe, and click that bell icon so you get a notification anytime we post a new video. But until next time, thanks for watching. And thanks for chiming in, geese.